Thank you very much. Please uh, take a seat. And it's a great, uh, it is a, it's a really great privilege for me to, to be here. I mean, I was here almost right as you started, and who could have thought then that that small group of people uh, hunting for venues could actually be where you are today? And in part that is because you have the most outstanding uh, leaders in the shape of Pastor Phil and Pastor Lucinda. But you know, let me tell you this, I have observed churches all over the all over the world. The fact of the matter is that they are amazing. I mean, Orm, Phil is almost amazing. I mean, I've, I've, I've known him <laughs> too long to know that it goes without a qualification. In fact, the first time we had a, had a time out in the bush, Phil is, comes from Australia, we'll forgive him that, won't we? But they don't have bush there. They don't understand what animals are. So we had to explain to them there's, you know, there's green grass, it's not all pavements, you know, it's not a zoo. But, the, it, this, but Phil's hair was even more sort of golden then as it was. And isn't it amazing how he's managed to keep his hair at the, the, at the, where, it, where it is? The only problem about it was is that when we came up to a herd of buffalo, they thought he was a lion because they saw this, they saw this hair, this sort of golden... And then we had to sort of restrain him. There was a an elephant coming towards us, flapping its, uh, its ears and going low. And those of you know that that's the danger sign. Well, Phil thought that was a moment to take a photograph. So anyway, he survived, um, and it's a privilege to be here. But you know, the thing is that what distinguishes him uh, is the fact that you are here. The fact is that he couldn't do, nor could Lucinda do, what they have done so amazingly without the time the energy and the money which you as a congregation have given them and supported them. So as they rise to this new interim global senior pastor, gosh, I can hardly get the words out, um, role, I am not surprised because they have been servants of this community, whether it's here, whether it's in Mitchell's Plain, whether it's feeding the poor, looking after people in, in, in COVID times, helping the brokenhearted, dealing with the marginalized, that is their heart, and their heart is for Africa. But they were servants. Now, during this week, we've celebrated uh, the fact that the Queen of England, who is also, of course, the head of the Commonwealth, which South Africa is a member, and she's been on the throne for 70 years. And it's amazing to think of the link with Africa, because when, as a 21-year-old, her birthday was in, uh, in the Cape, and she made that great speech, which she said that she would continue to serve for the rest of her life. And who could have thought that 70 years later, she would still be there. So she issued a statement, um, which we will show there. And the statement comes from Buckingham Palace, 5th of February. And it's an amazing thing, saying thank you to everybody. But it ends with two words. And those two words, in my view, are the most significant of the whole of her reign. She has a vibrant faith in Jesus Christ, and it's the faith that has sustained her. And that faith has led her to be, in my view, just like Jesus, um, was a servant. And she signed it, your servant, Elizabeth R. Regina, Queen. Your servant. And that's surely what we would all want to remember, that we are servants. As the queen is a servant, so we are servants. And that's what I love so much about your church. But I want to talk a bit about the interim. Um, it's a fashionable word at the moment because your, your pastor is an interim. Um, because it seems to me that we are in that in-between stage. After the third year of COVID, we are in between. Oh, there is that unsettling piece. Uh, my wife and I were walking along, along the beach and watching the tides. And the interesting thing, I was reading a book that was talking about, you know, we think, or I thought, that between high tide and low tide, there was just, a, just a, you know, dead sand. But actually, that dead sand is crawling with life. If only you'd scratch around and look. 
you would find sort of crabs and other things which were scuttling around. And we think that this interim time, this time of COVID when we're uncertain, we can't see properly, we can't work out where we're going, is a dead time, but it's not. If we would scratch about, if we would look, we would actually see there is life in between the tides. Now, some people would want to go back to the old tide, that what we thought was a high tide, but actually it's a new time coming, and I sense the tide is turning. We're living in a complicated world at the moment. Who knows what's going to happen on the macro-political world? Who knows what's going to happen to our finances globally? Who happens to know what's going to happen to our churches? Will people be coming back? Governments in all parts of the world are struggling. Unemployment is rising in this country. Who knows what that future looks like? But I sense that we are seeing a turn in the tide, and the tide is that of the faith and belief in Jesus Christ. What the world most needs, we have, which is the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ who comes as a servant to give us true sight of what he really longs for us to be doing. And you know, I don't know, about a year or so ago, we were asking ourselves the question, am I going to make it? Am I going to get through this COVID time? And then after a while, maybe six months ago, we were saying, I think we're going to make it. And then Time magazine told us the dawn is breaking. And that's what I sense is happening, that there is a, a new world coming, a new dawn is breaking. A new dawn that might have economic and financial effects, but also a deep spiritual effect uh, on all of us. And that's what I want to look at today. It's not, the question is not, what are these days to make of us? What are these days going to make of us? We used to ask, are we going to make it through these days? But now I think the question is, what are these days going to make of us? What have we learned from this time? What are we learning? What are we looking for? And I think that the Lord wanted to say to us that in this in-between, this unsettling stage, if I use the phrase again, this interim stage, where we're leaving one side and looking forward to the next, but we're not entirely clear what it is. We stand on this threshold of a new time, and what do we see? What do you see for yourself, for your family, for your church, for your nation, for the future? What do you really see? And it's the question I'm wanting to look at again in this space. And all during COVID, I asked myself the question, of God, what do you see in me that I don't see in myself? Do you know that? What does God see in you that you don't see in yourself? And that's what the Spirit of God does to draw out the good things in our life, to give us the opportunity of changing our lives, of finding a secure foundation to our lives, in the power of the Spirit of God. When Jesus came to die on a cross, he also took with it all the things that, that would hold us back and also came to rise again so that we might see a new life. But some, you know, can't see straight for the moment because of disappointment and discouragement, the disillusionment at work in our jobs, in our family, in our schools, in our hospitals, in our churches. This whole period of time has been one of deep sort of churning, a turning, and we're unsettled, we're lonely, unfulfilled, stagnant, stuck for many, not being able to see. But Helen Keller, the, the blind author, said to us, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And so we look around and we say, maybe we've lost our sight. We just begin to accept things as they are rather than as they could be. And you're having Vision Sunday coming up, which is why it's so important that we are able to look forward with hope because it's hope that we can offer the world. It's hope in Jesus Christ to change. So instead of just believing big and risking disappointment, we start playing it safe. 
And we look to the past and think that will govern us going forward, and it hasn't. So why is restoring the sight, this perspective, the way of looking at things so important? Because the eyes in your head will give you sight, but the eyes in your heart will give you vision. And it's the heart that moves us. And one of the biggest risks we find at the moment is that our sight is weakened by what we've experienced. Look, all of us have experienced tough times. You don't have to tell me, and I wouldn't dare tell you, that it's a stressful world out there. We're struggling on it. But I believe that we are looking to do what's next. He wants to deal with us and create this new normal, this new sight. So I want to look at two passages of Scripture. The first is in Mark. Mark chapter 8. And we've got it on the screen. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, and he led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him, and Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, I think that this is a relevant passage. Uh, Jesus then sent him home, sorry. Um, said, right, we've, we've done but the interesting thing that I want to do to look at is that in this passage, um, we, we, we've, we've had a season when we've had amazing teaching, largely because you've watched it online. You've been able to turn the best preachers, the best uh, teachers, the best worship, and we've had more than we can cope with on information. But now we're being called back into the people of God, gathering together in the power of the Spirit of God, working together, working in our communities, seeing the good news spread, seeing people's life change. Because what we need is not information, but we need transformation. We need to be transformed. And how do we get transformed? We get transformed by the touch of the Spirit of God. How do we shift our gaze? How do we shift our gaze? This is what this passage is dealing with. Do you know it is six times in this passage we see Jesus touching, reaching out, as he does to you today. So let's look at what is, what is happening there. Um, we, we see the first thing is this. You go, he goes to the village, and he see that there's a blind uh, the blind person is there. Now, you would have thought that the Son of God, who can do any kind of miracle he wants to, would go to the person and say, right, eyes open. But he doesn't do that. What he does is he takes him by the hand. And while blind, they don't go for a walk. He leads him. And I want to pause there for a moment. For some of this period of time in this interim world, we've been blind. We haven't known which way to go. But we know that in the hand of Jesus, he will lead us. He won't just wander around with us. Wandering around, you know, saying, well, look, we're all in it together. There's nothing we can do. Um, we're blind. We don't really know. But what Jesus does is he takes the hand of that person and he leads that person determinedly. Sometimes we need to be prepared to be blind to the future and accepting the touch of Jesus to lead us. So he leads us out of and leads him out of the village. Why? Why couldn't he just heal him there and then? And I think the reason is that he takes him away from that which was familiar. 
from all the people that would be looking at him, from all the people that would be commenting to him. Here's the blind person. Here's the person sitting there. He takes him out of that environment and brings him outside the village. And this is what happens, I think, with us, that he is taking us in and through that painful time of, of, the, of, of COVID, bringing out of the familiar in order to do something miraculous. And then what does he do there? He takes some spit and puts it into the ground. Now, I don't particularly like being spat on by anybody, but I suppose spit from the Son of God is okay. If you have it. But the point about it is he takes the spit, which is of divine source, and takes the ground, which is where we are living. It's as if heaven comes to earth and he mixes those two things. This is not a God who is completely distant. It's a God who lives with us and puts it on the eye. And then he says to the, to the guy, well, 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 what can you see? And he kind of says, well, I can't see very well, but I can see trees moving. He can see a sort of, a sort of shape but he doesn't know what that shape is like. He thinks it's a tree. It makes me think that he wasn't blind from birth. Probably knew what a tree looked like. And that's where we are in so much of the COVID times that we're at, is that what we've got is a situation where our eyes are beginning to open, but we can see a kind of shape. We kind of think, we can't see quite clearly. We can see a shape of what it might look like. My business might come back if the sales pick up. And if only the government wouldn't be so, there we are, and would, would do more for us, there we are. Every government everywhere in the world, everybody says the same thing. If only this, if only that, then we would be able to see. But we're seeing at the moment we've got tree sight. And what we need is true sight. We need true sight. The sight that comes that God gives to us of what that future would look like rather than, than being able. But there is movement. We've seen this movement. We see something happening in this COVID time. We understand that. And what he does is he then does the second touch. And it's the second touch that I think we need. We've had a touch of the Spirit of God during this COVID time when we saw things, but they weren't very clearly defined. We weren't sure about anything. There were those people here who, who know what it was like to see in 2019 and now I've lost the vision and you know, kind of things are walking around. We thought of a new church, of impacting a city, new salvations, life transforming, communities impacted, our children understanding the things of God, our schools being, being more, uh, more open than they have been, our, our hospitals not being full We've had this whole sense of, 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 of there being a, a shapelessness around. And God calls us to say, it's time for a touch. Because behind every touch, there is a test. The test is, will you trust him? He'll extend his hand, even though you're blind, to lead you into the future. Will you trust him? Because the test is there, behind the touch. And then you saw what happened. Then Jesus put the spit onto him again. And the second touch was the one that transformed the pains of uncertainty, the unsettling that this man had. Um, the second touch tells you that you've got the strength to keep believing when you don't feel like believing when it becomes clearer and we say to ourselves, each one of us is asking, Lord, will you touch me again? I've known your touch in the past. I need your second touch now. I need it now for the new dawn that is breaking. Not the old touch that was needed for the beginning of this difficult season that we've been in. I'm hurting, Lord. I don't have it figured out. I don't know what next week will look like, let alone next year. Lord, we need a new touch from you. We need that second touch. And once again, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. And then his eyes were opened. 
His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. It's a wonderful piece that. That we can see things clearly as God would want us to do. It doesn't mean to say that the uncertainties of life, the difficulties of life, the harshness of commercial compromises, the, the, the pain of businesses that are failing. The, 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 it doesn't mean to say all of that just suddenly goes away. But it does mean that we can see clearly that there is a God whose hand is put into our hands. And he sees, and he sees everything clearly. He'll give you the direction. He'll give you the discernment that is needed. And tree sight will change to true sight. And then what he says is go home. Go back to what you were doing. But changed. Changed. No longer blind. He, can, he has changed. He's able to, to see something extraordinary that, that the God of all creation has touched him, turned his life, transformed him. He doesn't need information about this person, Jesus. He has the transformation of the person, Jesus, in his own life. And he can see it. And that's the same message for you and for me. Go back to your home, to your school, to your gym, to your small group, to the work that you're doing in, 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 in the areas around you. Go back, but go back changed. Changed with having seen that the power of God is able to transform your life in the power of the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus does. He brings good news. He brings change. And I want to look at one more scripture which is in, to be found in, in Luke chapter 13. Then, then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Three years. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it if it bears fruit next year fine if not cut it down one more year now in that picture you see God the Father looking at the vineyard and saying the people have all gone astray and Jesus comes as Jesus' mission on earth was to say to the Father, give them a second chance. We've talked about a second touch. But also he gives us a second chance. You may have messed up in your life. Your relationship's not what they could be. You know that you've done things that are displeasing to God. You sense the shame and the guilt of all that is added up to your life. And you kind of don't know what to do. And he says, I'll give you a second chance. It's what he asked of the, of the vine, of the keeper of the field, to keep that fig tree for one more year. And I want to be specific for you, this church, and you, the people here in Hillsong. This is the year of the Lord's favor you have taken as the text for your vision Sunday. But it is one more year. So what do we do? Do we just say it's one more year? Isn't that great? Well, I hope it will be. One more year to see whether there is any fruit. I'm not suggesting that there wasn't any fruit in your case. But what I am suggesting is that there is going to be an increase of fruit in one more year. And you could say, well, that's great. And if you're kind enough to have me back in a year's time, we'll do a little audit and find out whether it worked or not. But the fact of the matter is, he's saying, no, no. What does, the, what does the gardener, the person working there do? He says, give me a chance. Give me a second chance to be able to fertilize and to dig up the soil. And that's what you and I are called to do. 
It's not just to stand back and wait and say, God, give me a second chance. I've really screwed up. I, I need a second chance. I know I've messed up my life. There's not much fruit in my life. But no, he says, I give you a second chance. But what we need to do is to dig around it. What does that digging look like? It looks like coming to, to reading the Bible, praying, worshipping, and also working in the communities that you are serving, serving others, not just concerned for yourself, that enables you to dig around it and to aerate the soil by the Spirit of God, to allow the breath of the Spirit of God to come into your life as you dig up the things that were heavy and holding you back and restraining you from being fulfilled and being fruitful. In the King James Version of the Bible, it says, dig and dung, pretty straight. Put the fertilizer in, put the nutrients into the ground and the nutrients are found in this community of the people of UP led by uh, but in this church that you are led in a way where there are nutrients you've got the great courses that you've just been 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 looking at for almost every need that you would have those are the nutrients those are the ways in which God just not only gives us a second chance but enables us to say, I'm doing it with you. In the same way as Jesus spat on the ground. He didn't have to. He could have touched the eyes. But he wants to show there's a link between what is on earth and what is of God. Between what God can do to bring fruit and what you can do to dig and to work the soil of your lives. To plow up the hard spaces and allow the Spirit of God to bring the fruit that I fundamentally believe will continue to grow in this amazing church that you have planted here and all over Africa where you are planting all the churches that even your senior pastor wasn't able to remember because there are so many will there be. So we, we believe there is a second chance and we know there is a second touch. And I wonder if you could stand for a moment. I would like to pray. Maybe you'd like to put your hands out. Is what we do is the way in which we receive from God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you that by your Spirit, you will touch each individual person here. I know I would have spoken a word from you into their lives. And now, Lord, give them a second touch, a second touch of your Spirit. Transform their lives right now. And for those who need it, just a second chance, a new opportunity to work with you and to hear from you. Fill them now with your Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, what a powerful word from Ken Costa. Lift your gaze heavenward. I know that word has impacted me deeply, especially in this season that we are in as a church. I wanted to take a moment and I want to pray for some people. Maybe you're here and you just say, you know what? Well, actually, I'm going to pray for two groups of people. Well, number one, you're just saying there's a lot of stuff going on in my life right now. And I've got to fix my gaze on Jesus. I've got to remind myself, realign myself, turn my eyes back to Jesus. I want to pray for you if that's you. So Father God, I pray just for everyone who maybe has been where life has maybe got in and things have been hard and difficult and situations that try to take our distraction away from you. Lord, I pray that we would fix our eyes back on you this morning. Thank you. Your word says actually that you're the author and perfecter of our faith. So we turn our eyes to you in Jesus name. Amen. I want to pray for another group of people. Uh, maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, I know about him, but I don't know him intimately. And uh, I want to ask you today, if, if you're there and you're just saying, you know what, I need to give my life to Jesus. And after Ken's words, you're just saying, I, I feel a, a disconnect from God. I want to ask you to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You know, friend, he came for you. He came to die for your sins. He came to give you access to the presence of God and to give you life eternal. If that's you, we want you to let us know. You can check the information below. We also have a good news guide, but before any of that, I want to pray for you, uh, that you uh, would invite Jesus into your heart. You can say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, 
I turn from my sin and I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. Come into my life, come into my heart, come into my situation and change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, wherever you are, even if it's on the chat, come on, let's give those people a massive encouragement. You can use an emoji, you can use a fist pump, you can use whatever you want to just encourage those people. And hey, if you need prayer today, we actually have a lot, the guys just told me this, we have a live Zoom prayer room, a live Zoom prayer room where our team are going to pray with you, connect with you. And so all of that information is coming up now. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to stand with you. And maybe this is your first time here and you're like, I, you know, I, I don't know really what's going on. Join us. Just jump on. It's just a link. A couple of minutes. Get to know us. And we, most importantly, would love to get to know you. God bless church. What a significant day in God's house. And I am believing in the run up to Easter, it is going to be an incredible few days of deeper devotion, of God working in our hearts and lives as we celebrate all that Jesus has done for us. Mm -hmm.